The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. Liberal is a key word. We're starting a three-week sermon series looking at what it means to be liberal in this somewhat illiberal world these days. We celebrate in rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. We welcome diversity, including diversity of beliefs from divine believers to humanists, from pagans to atheists and agnostics. We believe in the compassion of the human heart, in the warmth of community, the pursuit of justice, and the search for meaning in our lives. We gathered this morning on traditional Cree lands that are now part of Treaty 6 and shared by many nations. A treaty is an inheritance and a responsibility and an ongoing relationship. So may we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards of our planet, and good ancestors to our children. The opening words are by Heather Januels. We come this day called by war, by suffering inflicted and endured when minds across borders fail to reason and compromise. We come this day called by loss, the deaths of those who served in our name, those whose lives ended before their natural course in service to a cause greater than their own. We come this day called by hope, hope that we will in some season finally surrender our swords into plowshares. And we come this day called by peace. May we hear its song. May we proclaim its promise. May our remembrance today renew our struggle. We can never stay or rest. I'd like to invite Erica Deneve and Alex to light our chalice today. This fire is a reminder of the light within us all, the yearning for freedom, the longing for truth, the flame of intuition, the torch of conscience. We dedicate this service to the remembrance of this holy light. Thank you. I want to begin this series on liberalism And I want to start with the definition, and one of the great things about the Internet is when you're looking around for definitions, you can find them in the most interesting places. In the United Kingdom, schools go through O-levels and A-levels, and this is actually from the uh, student guide for A-level students about liberalism. The logical starting point towards understanding any ideology concerns its view of human nature. In straightforward terms, Liberals share an optimistic attitude towards human nature. This is based upon an assumption that our behavior is determined by rational interest rather than by irrational emotions and prejudice. Definitely a debatable principle. We are therefore governed by reason and should be entrusted with as much freedom as possible. The liberal belief that humans are rational creatures holds several implications. Firstly, it promotes the view that we are free to choose our own path in life regardless of what society dictates as the norm. Liberals firmly believe that we should be allowed to express ourselves fully as guided by our own free will. Another important implication derived from this rationalist perspective is the importance of human happiness. All liberals would concur with Aristotle's observation that happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim of human existence. There are a number of practical illustrations of this liberal attitude. The right of all adults, regardless of their sexuality, to marry the person they love is a recent illustration of this argument in play. Liberals seek to empower the individual, provided our actions do not harm the freedoms of others. John Stuart Mill wrote, The liberty of the individuals must be this far limited. He must not make himself a nuisance to other people. Liberals refute the notion that human behavior is shaped by irrational forces of superstition and religion. And finally, human rights should apply on a universal basis, regardless of gender, ethnicity, social background, or sexuality. 
Unitarian Universalism has always billed itself as a liberal religion from the earliest days of institutional life in the 19th century. But today, that kind of classical liberalism is misunderstood, both by our most fervent supporters and particularly by our opponents. Of course, liberalism these days is under dramatic attack from enemies, some of whom use the disgustingly offensive term libtard to describe pretty much anyone who challenges their viewpoints. Now, I am a lifelong liberal, for better or worse, and wish to reestablish the ground for this philosophy that means so very much to me and governs my life. I think it holds hope for a better future. So in these three services, I'd like to do three things. First, today I want to explore the roots of our classical UU connection to the philosophy while defining liberalism. Next Sunday, I want to look at the virulence of the most recent attacks on liberalism coming from the extreme right and discuss the impacts of this populism on the global political climate. And finally, on November 25th, I want to offer a call to action for reclaiming liberalism because it is bleak times right now. But I won't be a call to arms or a call to match virulence with virulence. Instead, it will be a call for courageous steadfastness, for calm reasoning, and for faith in the long-term strength of the liberal cause. So, we Unitarian Universalists have traditionally characterized ourselves as liberals. Liberalism arose most notably in the 18th century during the Age of Enlightenment. It was a celebration of the rights of the individual, as you heard, and a rebellion against hereditary power and privilege. I'm the Lord, therefore I can do whatever the heck I want. Liberals said, no, that's not right. You should be bound by the same laws as everyone else. It would also become a justification for the limitation of state power of any kind, any kind of state, and the basis for the various charters of rights that have been adopted in many parts of the world. Now, what's sometimes forgotten to these days is that a key tool for liberalism is not a banner-waving call for freedom, but the applied use of reason and rationalism in service of core principles. At its most simplistic, the founding argument for liberalism ran, remember it was a religious time, human beings were all born of God's image and given the same free will. And therefore, they all deserve the same rights and treatment before the law. It was, you see, a logical proposition based on the premise of humans have free will. Now, you can agree or you can disagree with that premise. That's fine. However, it's not enough to say, I just dislike it. I don't think it's true. You have to justify your argument with rational arguments and reasons. It cannot be based on intuition, self-preference, or self-interest. Claims are not justified by high-blown rhetoric or refuted by angry denunciation. Questions are to be considered with calm reasoning and an examination of facts. doesn't mean you're not getting exercised, but you need to stick to the discipline of reason and fact. The method of liberalism is debate and proof, not fury or ad hominem attacks on opponents. A liberal that is not willing to listen to or at least try to comprehend the position of their opponents does not deserve the title liberal. A liberal finally must always be open to the possibility of changing their mind in the face of new and persuasive information. Now that's basic liberalism, a predisposition to the rights of the individual, including basic equality, supported by a methodology of debate and discussion based on reason and fact. One does one's best with the information available at the time. I was reminded of an example two weeks ago at the Canadian Human Rights Museum in Winnipeg 
Several of us were there for the fall gathering, and as with many of our youth, most of our youth. In October 1970, radical Quebec separatists kidnapped a provincial cabinet minister and a British consul. Two weeks later, the minister was murdered. Prime Minister Trudeau, a classic philosophical liberal, probably the poster child for classic liberalism in the 20th century, invoked the War Measures Act, basically declared martial law in Quebec, and hundreds of separatist supporters were arrested without warrant. In the midst of the crisis, he was asked on camera, how far are you prepared to go? And his famous reply, yeah, just watch me. Now, most of the arrestees were questioned and released within a few days once it became clear that this was not a general uprising, but just a couple of small terror cells at work. Not all of them were released, and some were mistreated. But whatever way you look at it, it was a basic abrogation of civil rights. The thing is, well, I was 14 at the time, and I was living in Montreal, and terrorism was something very, very new in Canada. People were scared. There was overwhelming support for Mr. Trudeau's decision. Over 85% of both French and English Canadians supported the enactment of the War Measures Act. And yet, looking at the display in the museum, I realized that the Prime Minister had overreacted, that I had overreacted, that most of Canada had overreacted. Liberalism is not perfect. It makes mistakes. That said, when new information began to come to light, the Prime Minister slowly reversed his position and the army gradually relaxed its posture. That's the liberal response. When new information comes to light, don't be afraid to change your mind. But perhaps the most cogent criticism came from another liberal thinker, and some may disagree with that, the Parti Québécois founder and first leader, René Lévesque, who was still a journalist at the time, and he wrote, until we receive proof of the size of the revolutionary army, to the contrary, we will believe that such a minute, numerically unimportant fraction is involved, that rushing to the enactment of the War Measures Act was a panicky and altogether excessive reaction, especially when you think of the inordinate time they want to maintain this regime. It turns out he was right. Saying that René Lévesque was right is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> but that is liberal debate at work on both sides of a single question. Liberalism started as a political and perhaps social enterprise in the 18th century, and I want to get back to that now and go back to our historical timeline and leave the 19, 1970s where they belong with all of the clothes. <laughs> Ideas like that never remain within the realm of thought of discussion. It may have started as a political discussion, but it quickly spread into all other areas of thinking. So at the same time that the rights of people were being promoted in Europe and North America, the same debates were taking place within the precincts of churches and theological schools. That's where institutional Unitarianism was born. We can even go back a little bit farther. In 1519, the same year that Martin Luther was inspiring the Protestant Reformation, a Spanish theologian named Michael Servetus wrote an inflammatory book. It was outrageous. He noted that while the church demanded belief in the divine trinity, that the tripartite God is not actually mentioned anywhere in the Gospels or the New Testament at all. It's not there. It's a church teaching. It's not scriptural. So he said the unreasonable claims that we have to believe in a trinity should be changed. His small u, Unitarian proposition, meaning one God, not three, would in time lead to his execution at the hands of offended Christians. You see, they could not refute his argument rationally, so they killed him, and they called it heresy, which was the 16th century version of fake news. But the seeds of rational religion had been sown. 
It would be two centuries before a rationalist approach to religion would begin to coalesce and an actual church would form. And it happened in England first, then in North America. The Servetian rational approach to religion did not die with him. The ideas continued to percolate throughout the reformers. And the first British Unitarian clergy were men who were trained as Anglicans, but who found that they could no longer sign the required articles of faith that the church demanded of them. These were articles that required things like belief in the miracles. And yes, belief in the Trinity. And they said, this doesn't make sense. And so they broke off and they started Unitarian chapels. And as an interesting side note, the very first one of them was formed above a tavern near the law courts. Now, in part, these breakaways were a reaction to a conservative climate, kind of like we're seeing today. English and American religions were in the throes of the Great Awakening, a passionate period of Calvinist piety and religious fervor where belief was everything. Scientific facts and awkward things like questions were suspect and quickly condemned. Within the American Congregational Church, which was sort of the largest middle-of-the-road Protestant denomination at the time, there was a liberal wing that was uncomfortable with this passionate pose because there was a conservative wing in the Congregational Church that was trying to make them all into true little believers. A group of ministers stood against this. And in 1819, William Ellery Channing spoke out at the most public event possible, an ordination. Half of his speech in Boston defended the use of human reason in interpreting Scripture. His arguments ignored the Holy Spirit. In the second half of the speech, he supported the results of theology not handed down directly by God, but developed within the human mind. Religion had to make sense. And it had to fit with scientific fact. And if it didn't, it was religion that would have to change. New information, changing viewpoints. Harkening back to Servetus, the Trinity was the first thing to go. He said, we object to the doctrine of the Trinity that it subverts the unity of God. But rejecting the Trinity was only a starting place. He dismissed the miracles out of hand. Then he said, Christ was not both God and man, nor any more divine than any other human being. There's God in all of us if there's God in any of us. Humans had the will and the conscience to discern right from wrong and the reason to chart their own moral course. We are good enough to figure it out. So in short, virtually every doctrine that seems fundamental to the Christian religion, Channing renounced that day. It was all terribly shocking. Pamphlets flew back and forth. The Unitarian Christianity sermon was reprinted 20 times. In a few weeks, the American Unitarian Association was born in Channing's study in Boston in a gathering of several ministers, and it would become a powerful voice and remains a powerful voice in Massachusetts and New England to this day. From the beginning, the liberal approach to religion built on its democratic philosophy and extended its arguments to the issues of the day. It wasn't just enough to sit in church and think nice liberal thoughts and figure it out for yourself. You had to live your values into the world. And so they attached, attacked or challenged the issues of the day. Abolition of slavery, the rights of women to vote, establishment of public education, prison reform, and, well, temperance. (laughs) But new information, never mind. From the beginning, we have also had a common focus on social justice, therefore. Our actions on the common good, however, are based on our liberal principles and values and should be argued and justified in a logical manner. The beauty of the philosophy is it has no fixed, predictable positions. In the 20th century, following the despairing reality of the Great War, many people lost faith in the existence of God. 
and a group of Unitarians in the 1930s forged what became known as the Humanist Manifesto, a very interesting document. You can look it up online. It's only about 30 uh, small passages that outlines what a religion would look like that did not rely on the God they no longer needed. It became a powerful force within Unitarianism for the next four decades. But then, pendulum swing. New information comes to light. And in the 1970s, people started to say, you know, things have grown a little dry and austere, and it's starting to sound more like a university lecture. Uh, No disrespect to university lecturers. But we really are a church and a community, and there has to be something else as well. And so they said pure reason is grand, but maybe it's not enough. Humans need something more. Maybe not God per se as we know it, but maybe a different idea of God or the divine or something else that's beyond us. We came to see the value of awe and mystery again. And in the debates that brought about our current statement of principles, you can see the ongoing conversation between humanism and personal spirituality and how both coexist in the sources as respected parts of our tradition without giving primacy to either. So here we are today in a church that values both passion and rationality. But if we face a challenge in these days of political populism, it's to find a way to hang on to the rational part of that philosophy without letting ourselves get dragged into the passion and the virulence of the people who defame us. We need to avoid becoming just another group of partisans in the loud screaming match that now defines both the U.S. government and, sadly, many governments around the world. We need to embrace, we need to avoid embracing the tactics of the mob because that is against our liberal core values and undermines our cause badly. But that's really the topic for next week's sermon. I believe in the value of rational debate and discourse. If I carry a sadness in me these days, and I do, it's how that kind of conversation one that allows for, oh, I don't know, listening to somebody else's point of view, allows for the possibility of compromising when that seems the best course, and one that depends on real and generous attention and respect for others, that has fallen out of favor on the right, but far too often also on the left. Amen. This prayer by a good friend, Barbara Peskin. Spirit of life, whom we have called by many names in thanksgiving and in anguish, bless the poets and those who mourn. Send peace for the soldiers who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. Let strong trees grow above the graves far from home. Breathe through the arms of their branches. The earth will swallow your tears while the dead sing, No more, never again, remember me. For the wounded ones and those who received them back, let there be someone ready when the memories come, when the scars pull and the buried metal moves, and forgiveness for those of us who were not there and for our ignorance. And in us, Veterans in a forest of a thousand fallen promises, let new leaves grow on our stumps. Give us the courage to answer the cry of humanity's pain with our bare hands, out of full hearts, with all our intelligence. Let us create peace. Our chalice light is extinguished and the guns are silenced. It is our inheritance, it is our responsibility to work towards a world that's better, where we speak rather than shoot, where we find ways to keep negotiating. So carry this light with you when you leave this place and share it with those you love, with those you know, and especially others who most need to hear it.